Strings are an important part of modern day computing. While a computer is perfectly fine just working with ones and zeros, we as humans need text to transport and transfer information through writing, reading and verbal communication. So it's no wonder that Rust also takes strings very seriously. But as if it wasn't already difficult enough to learn the language, Rust brings at least a whopping six string types to the table, of which all six have their specific meaning and right to exist. Gladly, when dealing with the most common tasks in developing software, we usually only have to deal with two of those types, string and str. But even those often give many new arrestations a hard time and some headache, especially regarding when to use which. So let's look at those two string types and find out what each of them does. str is the primitive string type, also called string slice. It's an immutable sequence of UTF-8 encoded characters somewhere within a program's memory, which is why we usually encounter it in its borrowed form, reference str. It's a pointer to somewhere within our program's memory. That string slice can point to basically three different things. A string in static storage, which is when the string is hard-coded into our binary and loaded into memory at runtime. In that case, we deal with a string slice with a static lifetime. A heap allocated string, which is when the string slice points to a string. And a stack allocated view of binary data, which is when a string slice points to a stack allocated binary array, for example. A string, on the other hand, is an own type that we can mutate. And it also represents a UTF-8 encoded sequence of characters. We can add other sequences of characters or strings to it, as well as string slices. And we can pass it and its ownership around. These are the very basics of strings and string slices. To answer the question from the beginning, however, if you remember when to use which of those types, we need to go a little further. Let's start by taking a look at function arguments, because it's not uncommon to pass one or multiple strings into a function. And this is often where the struggle begins. When dealing with function arguments, we usually need to ask ourselves two questions. Do we need ownership of the argument or arguments? And do we want or need to mutate them? If we can successfully answer these questions, we can already derive our answer. If we, however, struggle to answer that question, we can always just start with a plain owned string. Calling a function that takes an own string transfers the ownership of that string over to the function. And we might have to call clone repeatedly if we still want to reuse the original string later. But it's the easiest way to deal with the issue. As long as we don't work on performance-critical code, that constant cloning won't hurt us too much. And additionally, the compiler will often point us in the right direction by telling us when we've missed a call to clone. If we, however, don't want to accept the burden of constantly cloning a string, we can start to pass that string as a reference, using reference string. This effectively borrows the value and allows us to reuse it later, without constantly having to clone it. As soon as we want to mutate that reference within our function, we can also use a mutable borrow, which then allows us to modify the string to our liking. In that case, we don't even have to look further. A mutable reference to a string is probably exactly what we need in that case. If we don't need to mutate the string at hand, we can go one step further and even simplify the API of our function. We can just accept a borrowed string slice. That borrowed string slice does not only cover reference string, but also most other forms of a string that can occur in Rust, which gives us the greatest flexibility. So, in summary, the following rules will most likely give us the least headaches and work the best for function arguments. We start with a borrowed string slice. If we want or need to mutate the value, we should roll back to a mutable reference of a string. If we need ownership, we should roll back to an own string and add mutability in case we really need both. The compiler will help us along the way. If a compilation fails, it will usually even tell us what to change to make our code work. Now that we have some rules for arguments, let's talk about function return types. Here we need to ask ourselves two different questions. Do we create something new or can we return a view on something? Once again, if we can answer these questions, we can already derive an answer for something like 98 to 99% of use cases. And if we can't, we can simply start with an own string again. In case of returning an own string, it doesn't even hurt us that much. 
because we transfer the ownership of that string directly to the caller of our function, which is usually what we wanted to do anyway. Sometimes we might have to add a call to toString at the end of our return statement, but that is fine. If we want to take this to the next level, we need to start to think about our guiding questions when deciding what exactly to return. When we really create something new, we have to return an own string. In some rare circumstances, however, the result of our function might actually be derived from an already existing string. And in that case, it can make perfect sense to return a borrowed string slice. In such cases, we often return a specific view of already existing data, like extracting a substring. Here, we can save ourselves an allocation and just use the string slice for what it was meant for. In some even rarer circumstances, however, we might hit a wall. Sometimes a function might need to create either something new or return a view on something existing. In that case, we are stuck with the type system that requires consistent return types to work. If we hit that wall, it's perfectly fine to just roll back to an own string and swallow the unnecessary allocation in some of the cases. If we are more experienced, however, we could also solve this issue with a smart pointer like cow, which stands for clone on write. It's an enum that works with both borrowed and owned values and provides the consistent return type we need. Where an allocation is necessary, we allocate. Where none is needed, we just return the borrowed view. Cow is still pretty advanced and usually not needed for most everyday use cases, but it's still good to know it exists. Once again, in summary, the following rules will most likely guide us in choosing which type of string to return from a function. We start with an own string. If all results our function can come up with are derived from the original input, we can return a borrowed string slice. In very advanced use cases where the result of a function is either something new or something derived from an existing string, we can try a smart pointer like cow. The compiler will also guide us here and give us helpful error messages along the way. The last thing we can now explore is strings and structs. The questions we need to ask ourselves here are pretty easy this time though, and they go like this. Do we really need to store a string slice in a struct? And do we really, really, really? If we can answer these questions with absolute confidence, we already know our answer. If not, we can once again start with an own string. And in 99% of all use cases, we will probably even leave it at this. Passing an own string into a struct is absolutely perfectly fine. And it is what we will do most of the time. Sometimes we will need to call clone one or a few times, but that's it then. This approach follows a simple principle. Associate all data with its container. If the container is dropped, its data is dropped. This saves us from many headaches we face when dealing with data being referenced in a struct, not outliving the struct and such. Only in very specific circumstances, it really makes sense to think about storing string slices in structs. And at the time we even have to think about this problem, we are probably already experienced enough to work on libraries or software that require principles like this to even work. So in summary, we can define the following rules for strings in structs. Start with an own string and then ask ourselves multiple times whether we really need to store a string slice and verify our answer another few times. Gladly, also in this case, the compiler will once again help us as much as possible. In general, string slices and strings and when to use which is not the most difficult topic, but it often takes a little more experience to realize that at some point it even becomes a no-brainer. I still hope you learned a thing or two and can now continue on your Rust journey with a little less headache. And we will hopefully see us in the next video.